Good stuff so far this morning. Amen? Amen. Take a copy of God's Word, and we're going to be in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, is we, we, where we're going to find ourselves today. Mark, chapter 6. So whether you open it or scroll to it, get yourself there. We're going to be examining the first part of this particular uh, chapter of the book of Mark. You know, have you come across profound thoughts or statements maybe that you've come across on the internet? There is a site called Reddit, which a lot of times will have questions that people will ask back and forth, or not just that, sometimes you can go there to find help with a specific problem you might have. Think of it as a text version of YouTube. And so someone proffered this particular question on Reddit, and it kind of gained some traction, and so I'm going to share it with you. If you could go back and meet your 13-year-old self, but could only tell them three words, what would you say? Mm. Oh, you already got a hand up. Yeah, you haven't even hit 13 yet, have you? Nah. <laughs> Sign sign language, okay. So here are some of the responses. Some of the responses were wise, some were goofy, some were heartbreaking, some were profound. Here are some of the top-ranked ones. Brush your teeth. Yeah, my daughter would go for that one. Don't date blank. Insert your name there. Don't date blank. Yeah. Invest in Amazon 2003. Okay? Get brother help. Listen to dad. Give mom love. Talk to people. Enjoy your childhood, it gets better. Hmm. Deep down, people want another chance, an opportunity for something more than what they have. And while we can't go back in time and benefit from future wisdom, we can we can make a choice now that can direct you to a better life. This morning, Jesus is going to show us that he is a God of second chances that can forever change your life if, if you don't reject him. So are you willing to see this morning what he's all about? I know any word from him will be more impactful than any phrase you might be able to say to your past self. So let's see what we can learn from Jesus and make a wise choice today to follow, to learn from, and to continue on with him. So let's pray. Dear Jesus, we do thank you for today. God, we ask that we will be willing to make a choice, a choice today for the better, a choice to pay attention to what's going on around us, a choice to respond. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So let's look at Mark chapter 6, starting in verses uh, 1, and we're going to make our way through 6. And hey, guys on the front, can you help me this morning? Okay, do that for me, all right? So Jesus says this, Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in a synagogue, and there were many listening, and they were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him? And such miracles that are being performed by his hands. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? 
and they took offense at him. Jesus said to him, them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and his own household. And he could do no miracles there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief. And he was going around the villages teaching. So what's going on here in these six verses that we have? Historically, Mark wants us to see Jesus offering people another chance. I mean, I did say God's the God of second chances. If we're going to be honest, God is the God of many chances. Many chances up to a point. But what is that point? Well, we'll kind of look at that a little bit today. And so Jesus returns to his hometown of Nazareth, where he has faced rejection before. So as I read these words today and you saw what was being said, just know that something similar had happened at the beginning of his ministry in his hometown as well. At the onset of his ministry, Jesus entered the synagogue in Nazareth. He read from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, telling them that it had been fulfilled in their hearing. And these were some of the things that Jesus had said as he quoted the prophet Isaiah. They heard that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, that he was bringing good news to people. So let that kind of sink in your mind, good news. That's what he was bringing. They heard that he would tell the people a better way to live. Okay, so let that one be there. Good news, a better way to live. Not just that, they heard that he would heal and help, okay? So heal and help. All these things sound great, right? Good news, a better way to live, heal and help, right? He was going to do that by giving sight to the blind and setting free those who were oppressed. So you think, right, everybody hearing that, they're going to give a giant woohoo. But that's not what the Gospels record. Upon hearing these words, Scripture tells us that those of his hometown at the beginning of his ministry were filled with rage, that they cast him out of the city, right? The place where he grew up, the mob filled with rage, escorted him very politely by holding his hand, right? No, no pushed and pressed and yelled as they pushed him out of the city with the intent, catch this, the intent to push him off the cliff at the edge where the town rested. So the man that they had watched grow up as a boy who read the scripture telling these great things were filled with rage, said, you got to go. And by the way, why don't you go by the way of a really long first step? Whoa. That's how they responded. And yet, here in Mark chapter 6, we see that Jesus comes back to their synagogue after this rejection, right? Would you want to go back if you had been so politely asked to leave where you grew up? No. Some of us have such harsh memories about growing up or about other things that we think, man, I'm never going back, never going to talk, never going to do, right? And sometimes we hold on to that for a really long time to our detriment. And yet Jesus, he goes back to share that the truth of these things, the things that he told them, they happened. These things that I said, they're happening. And he comes back, I believe, to say, you know what? They can still happen for you too. 
So this morning, as you're sitting here in this room, and you might have dealt with God in what you thought was good and in your own way, maybe you've outright rejected him, maybe you are hesitant about the things that he has said, maybe you're here thinking, maybe one more chance, I don't know. I want you to know everything that God has always promised, everything that you have heard, but yet you're kind of like this on, He is still offering that to you today, regardless of how you have treated, acted, said, or done in the past. Would you take advantage of another chance like this? Let's keep going. What's being said about God here? Because theologically, we can see Jesus revealing the path of rejection. Yeah, there are some messages where we look at it and you go, okay, yeah, we can see where God is doing all of this. But I think God here is showing us something. He's showing us what it looks like to reject the cosmic creator of the universe to reject the one who created and loved us, the one who wants the absolute best for us. We're going to be able to see, yeah, it starts here. It kind of works its way here. It ends up here. Why would God show us this? Well, to help us see maybe where we're at on this particular path, right? Because since he is a God of Many chances. He wants us to know wherever we're at on that path of life that there can be hope for us. And so let's look at this. Mark wants us to see this path of rejection. And the people were initially, they were astonished by what he had to say. They were panicked by what Jesus said because it struck their sensibilities. It struck what they believed. Have you ever heard something and gone, ooh, I don't like that because it is so offensive to what you believe in your head, right? Sometimes we feel that way spiritually about things that are said. Sometimes we think about political things that way. Sometimes we think about, well, my mama always told me this, and this does not line up with that. You know, and we just automatically go, ooh, I'm paying attention now because there's just something not right. That's how these people were responding to Jesus. That's what their astonishment was. Whoa. See, in other words, they had had a hard time believing his claims. All the things that Jesus claimed, they were struggling with. They thought his words were suspect. You know, if we're going to be honest, all of us at some point or another have thought the claims and the the words of Jesus were suspect. You know, they doubted his ability. Can God really do? Can he really do? Right? That's where they were at. They diminished his significance. Have you thought about the way you or I or our society seeks to diminish who Jesus is and how they talk about him or what they call him or where they kind of push him off to the side, right? That's this astonishment that is going on. See, all of this can be seen literally in the questions that they were asking right? They questioned his connection to God by wanting to know where he got these things, right? Just who does he think he is? Who is he claiming to be? As they ask about the truth and the wisdom that's being given to him. So they're questioning that, right? Not just who he's connected to, but they're, they're, they're questioning, where did he get these thoughts, this insight, This wisdom, where did this come from? They continued on. They literally challenged the powerful miracles that he was performing by his hands. They had either heard it, some of them had seen it, but yet they were still questioning. That's why they were astonished. And then ultimately, this astonishment kind of culminates in as they bring up his occupation 
as a carpenter, okay? There is nothing insulting about being a carpenter. I'm sure he was a dandy carpenter, right? He learned this from his earthly father, Joseph, who was a carpenter by trade. But I want you to know that when they are stating that, oh, isn't he the carpenter? What they're saying is, oh no, he is not here. He is here. He's just like us, or maybe a little bit worse. And they they bring that even further down, right? Hey, don't we know his mama, right? Not just that, but how about his brothers? And then they bring it down even further. Well, aren't his sisters still here among us? Who does he think he is coming here saying these things, doing these things, and trying to tell us that we need something? That's the astonishment that they had. And if we're going to be honest, sometimes isn't that how we approach God too? It can be. The people took offense. So as if astonishment wasn't enough, so we, we stick there, maybe we're in the land of astonishment, but maybe we're in the land of offense. They fell into the trap of being enticed by their own sinful thoughts that caused them and those around them that they influenced to stumble, right? So sometimes we get caught up in thinking, well, I'm absolutely right. It's everybody else that's wrong, right? And so some of them were in this particular spot. In other words, they elevated their own importance. It's not that you're not important, but if you think you're the most important person in the room, chances are you've elevated yourself into a position that's not right. They sought to define their own truth. We hear this all the time, right? This is my truth. This, you can have your truth. Uh, what happens when your truth and my truth uh, don't do this? Uh, well, we have a, a problem, right? Truth is always truth. They didn't just do that, but they relied upon their own efforts. And hey, maybe you are awesome with your own efforts. Maybe you're strong. Maybe you're wise. Maybe you're capable. I mean, I know some of you. I know you are. But we are all capable to a point. There will always be somebody smarter, faster, better than you are, right? And sometimes it's not that we are putting ourselves down. We just realize we have to, our own limitations. I can run for 26 miles. I will not be the first person to cross the finish line for running 26 miles, right? You got to know your limitations. But we know a God that can do what? Go beyond our limitations. Allow us to do and accomplish things that we can't do on our own. Ultimately, though, these folks got mad if someone dared to question them. Do you know somebody like that? Are you that person? Don't question me. I've got it all figured out. How dare you imply that I am not where I need to be or doing the things that I need to do? And sometimes, as Jesus people, we struggle with this one, right? I, you know, I remember as a, as, a, as a student in college, I had the opportunity to attend for a semester OU before I surrendered to ministry and went to OBU. And obviously, one of those places would be more of a Christian university maybe than the other. At least it's in the name. Uh, I somewhat found it easier to witness and minister in Norman than I did in Shawnee. Uh, people in Norman kind of knew where they were at. Uh, sometimes people in Shawnee just got really upset that you were questioning their spiritual life, right? And, uh, and I kind of looked at it that way and thought, wow, if somebody came up and, and witnessed to tell me about Jesus because they didn't know me or they saw something in my life, I can respond to that in a couple ways. I can be happy that they care enough about me to want to make sure I knew, or I can be mad that how dare they question what they either witnessed or didn't witness about my life. 
maybe there was something wrong in my life that needed to be brought to my attention. After all, we are not perfect, are we? But yet, when we take offense, when we're not open, there's an issue, and we see that here in the people of Nazareth. Let's look at this last part then. Astonished. Offense from Scripture. The people chose not to believe. Now, that one's hard. It's hard to deal with. They were not persuaded to see Jesus for who he really is. In fact, the word for unbelief here in the original language of the New Testament, the Greek, is the opposite of faith. So faith in Greek is the word pistis. Here is apistis. It's got a negative on the front of it. So it's letting us know that unbelief is the direct opposite of having faith. Because we know that faith is knowing something and doing something about it. So unbelief then here in this case is knowing something and choosing not to do something with it. And that's where these folks were at. In other words, they ignored how Jesus had met the description of the prophets. They had heard Jesus read from Isaiah. They knew what they had been taught, but they chose to say, nope, not going to see the parallels, okay? Not just that, they didn't take to heart the clearly understandable words of Jesus. Think about it. Jesus taught in parables because if you're paying attention, they're easy to understand. They're easy, relatable words, right? And so out in our foyer this morning, I'm listening to, to Randy. He's talking about farming, and he's talking about how different types of soil require different types of work to do it differently. And that some soil is very forgiving, and some soil is not. That if you don't handle this right, you're not just going to mess it up here, but you're going to see that mess up several years coming down the line. And I just got to thinking, man, that, that has to be why Jesus taught, because I get that, right? There are some times where you can do something dumb or wrong, and it's kind of contained. But there are some times when you do something dumb that, I mean, it ripples out, right? It doesn't just pay that day. There are consequences that affect you maybe for the rest of your life, right? Now, we don't like that, but sometimes that's true. Jesus spoke so that all of us could understand. That's why he said, hey, let the little children come to me. The gospel message is so simple that a little one can get it. It's so supposed to be simple enough that we who think we know more than we do should be able to get it too. They refused to acknowledge the transformative acts Jesus had done. Those are the miracles. Now, I know what you might be thinking this morning. What miracles do we see today? Do we see people that rise from the dead? I haven't seen that, not, not like that. Have I, have I seen people who have been lame be healed? Not quite what we see here, but yet have we seen God transform? Have we seen people be healed? Yeah, yeah we have. Have we seen lives forever ever, ever, ever been changed. Lives that you thought there is no hope for that person, and yet God does something, and you go, oh my God, right? Only God can do that. We, as Jesus people, are the living testimonies that God transforms lives for the better. We are the walking miracles of God. Not because of us, but because of what he's done in us, right? Right? And so these people were rejecting that stuff that they could see with their eyes, and yet some of you in this room are rejecting that, and yet you know the stories. You have seen with your own eyes what God has done to your neighbors, to your friends, to your family members, and you're still kind of saying, eh, no. Why? That's what the, because when we read about it from the book, we go, how could they do that? How obvious. And then we go, it's not obvious enough apparently for me because I'm doing it today. We need to stop that. 
we need to realize that Jesus is not some insignificant real-life person of history and that we need to realize that he is that and so much more, that he is the God of the universe who came to live like us and among us to save us from that which we cannot save ourselves from because he loves us in a way that we will never, ever, ever fully comprehend. And you as parents know a glimpse of what that love is like. Because you've got children that you love like that regardless of what's going on in their lives right now. That's what we need to do. And so all of this can be seen in their lack of honor towards Jesus. Their unwillingness to come and be miraculously helped like the rest of Israel has been helped. And so I want to ask you, are you somewhere on this path of rejection? Somewhere in the land of astonishment or offense or just choosing not to believe? Because it is true. God is a God of multiple chances. But there's also this reality. Scripture tells us that there will be a time that God's Spirit does not always strive with us. And you're thinking, what? God gives up on me? No. We come to a point in our life where we say no so many times, where our choices and our distractions are so much more important to us, that it's not that God stops speaking, it's that we stop listening. We simply have no desire to respond to Him. I think we can call that a hard heart. When does that hit for people? I, I don't know. But have you seen somebody that that has happened to? It's tragic. It's ugly. No matter how passionately, how lovingly someone tries to share, there is just no desire for the things of God. Biblically, we see that happen to Pharaoh. God gives him all these opportunities. Pharaoh chooses to harden his heart until ultimately his heart is so hard that even at the loss of his firstborn son, he's not moved by God. If you are still aware of the path of unbelief today, then there's hope for you. There's an openness in you that God can do something amazing with if you choose to respond. And so here's how I want to wrap this up real quick for us. Real practically, there are three things I want us to see, okay? Because we're going to see Jesus giving people a better direction for life. And so here's the first one. We need to follow Jesus. You noticed at the beginning of Mark chapter 6 and verse 1, it talked about how his disciples were following Jesus. And if we're going to be real literal, following Jesus is really just one step in front of the other, right? I mean, that's how you follow somebody. But the word follow in the original language has this idea of being conformed to an example. So when they followed Jesus, they were choosing to be like Jesus, right? And while Jello might not be the dessert of kings anymore as it once was, what's interesting about Jello is that Jello takes on the shape of whatever you pour it into, right? When it sets up, that's the shape. And if you're good and you can do the jiggle thing right, it pops out and it looks like whatever it was in. When we follow Jesus, we are to be like Jesus. We need to follow Jesus like that. So when they see us, they see who? Jesus. So that's the first way that we need to be willing to do, to pick up his practices. Second is we need to learn from Jesus. All right? And this word learn in the original language is a little bit different than the way we use it, right? You know, when we look at the idea, it's the word for teach. And so sometimes we think, well, we can teach something and somebody doesn't get it. 
But it, the original idea is to teach means to cause someone to learn. So if you are really teaching, they are learning. And so the idea here is that, that we walk out having learned the awesome truth about God. All the truth, man, as much as you can handle. But you might say, but pastor, I only know this much truth. Are you living that much truth? That's where we start, right? You know, you know a little, live a little. You know more, add it to it, add it to it, add it to it. It's not burdensome. How do I know this? Because Jesus says, my ways are not burdensome. You know, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. Take my yoke upon me. you right. My ways are not weary. You know, leave your burdens here. They're not harsh. So when we add the stuff of Jesus, we're not adding more rules to follow. We're adding more goodness to life. I don't have to. I want to. Lastly, we need to continue like Jesus. Okay. Jesus went to Nazareth. That's where he grew up. After being tempted in the wilderness, he came back. That's where he started. Rejection. He went off to Capernaum and a bunch of places that we've talked about as we've looked at the book of Mark. And so he came back. But he didn't just come back there. He did there, right? And he faced what? More rejection. But did you notice that at least this time there were several people who responded? Praise God, right? Do you think their lives were forever changed? You know, we read it as a parenthesis, but he was only able to heal and help these. Well, he, he wasn't, there was nothing limiting him from doing it. The limit was people's willingness to let him do that, right? It wasn't that Jesus didn't have the power. It's that people didn't want what he was offering. There were lives changed. Your life can be changed. But do you notice what it said at the end there of verse 6? And he continued throughout the villages. We do not have the foreknowledge and the awesomeness of God's wisdom all within us, right? We see things from an earthly perspective. We don't give up until we don't give up. Because who knows? Who knows when the day of salvation could be for somebody else? Who knows when life change could be? So Jesus didn't give up on the people. Jesus kept going. We're not supposed to give up. In a couple of weeks, we're going to look at the fact that Jesus is going to send out his disciples in his name to do what he has done. You know who the disciples are now, don't you? It's us. He's going to talk about sending us out. So we need to continue just like him.